Okay, wonderful. Hi everybody, welcome. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Uh, my name's Ben Spivak. I'm a lecturer here at the Centre for Forensic Behavioural Sciences. Uh, and it's my pleasure to um, kick off our first uh, uh, inaugural seminar for the C Center for Forensic Behavioral Science seminar series. The Center for Forensic Behavioral Science seminar series is going to be held regularly and is designed to de disseminate interesting and impactful research that's relevant to clinician, policymakers, students, and other individuals interested in the field of forensic psychology. Today, we are lucky to have Dr. Simon Davies, who will be presenting on his research on the relationship between change in risk assessment scores and recidivism. This is a topic that has garnered a lot of interest in recent years, as clinicians and others are increasingly looking to use evidence-based methods to monitor change in risk and guide intervention. Dr. Davies completed his PhD in forensic psychology in 2019 under the, under the supervision of one of our previous seminar guests, Dr. Devin Palashek, and one of our staff, Dr. Caleb Lloyd. In addition to his PhD, he has completed research for the Department of Corrections, the Ministry of Justice, and is currently conducting an evaluation of the New Zealand Child Sex Offender Register for the New Zealand Police. He's also a registered clinical psychologist. I'm sure that you're all really looking forward to this presentation, as am I. Now, um, just in terms of a few house rules, uh, you can enter, and I encourage you to enter your questions in the Q&A box on your screen and we'll leave those questions to the end of the presentation where I'll select those um, that Simon hasn't um, addressed through his presentation and ask them. All right, thank you. Thanks, Simon. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, and, and thanks to Swinburne for inviting me. Uh, it was a real shame that I couldn't give this in person when I was over in Melbourne a couple of months ago, but uh, really great to get the opportunity to, to come and, and give this talk today. So. Um, I'm gonna be talking through mostly my PhD research today. Um, looking at this relationship between change and, and dynamic risk and recidivism. Um, and I, I've titled it A Closer Look at That Relationship. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the late night US shows, um, you'll notice I've stolen that from Seth Meyers' popular segment. Um, sadly, this talk won't be quite that uh, in, entertaining or amusing, but uh, hopefully it will be uh, somewhat interesting and, and somewhat useful to, to those of you who are here today. Um, so let's just check this. So Ben's already sort of mentioned uh, the relevance of, the, of this type of area of research. Um, and I'm guessing, I'm sort of assuming that most of the people here today have got some semblance of, of um, familiarity with this type of area. But a just quick recap, because a lot of what I'll be talking about today is sort of he heavily methodological and, and looking at ways of um, understanding and, and approaching research in this area. Uh, but it's really important to keep coming back to, to why it's important, why it matters. Um, and, and so I guess the key part, the key point is this first one around the idea that assessing risk is really central uh, to correctional practice, uh, and in fact, to, to practice across the criminal justice system. Um, but, but we're going to focus mostly around the correctional area today. And, and that's used in many different ways, but um, particularly to, to guide intervention and to guide management. Um, and the best way of guiding that management, although more commonly risk assessment relies on variables that can't change or can't change through any sort of conscious effort, things like your age and your criminal history, which we generally refer to as static risk factors. Um, assessment increasingly is incorporating dynamic risk factors, so things that, that can change, uh, that can be then targeted in treatment or can be monitored over time. Uh, and that really gives us an opportunity to, to intervene and to, to try to uh, prevent further offending from occurring to help, to help people move towards uh, more positive outcomes in their lives. So then what, what actually are dynamic risk factors? Well, a simple um, definition, or at least the, the key sort of empirical criteria that we can look to are these three here. So uh, a dynamic risk factor, to be a risk factor to start with, needs to be associated with increased recidivism. It needs to be able to change over time, and those changes need to, to be real related to recidivism. So if we were to take an example of uh, employment, or, or rather unemployment, as might be the case, um, to, be a, to be a risk factor, people who are unemployed need to be more likely to, to re-offend, um, to recidivate than those who are employed. Um, it needs to be able to change over time, you need to be able to move from being employed to being unemployed, or, or vice versa. And those changes then need to be linked to recidivism. So then 
what does that actually look like? And so just when we say that change in dynamic risk factors should change the likelihood of recidivism, we can imagine an individual, Mr. Green here, uh, looking at the most simplest design we can have to assess change, we need to have at least two assessments. So an initial, uh, what we'll describe as a baseline assessment, and then at least one um, reassessment. So reassessment being defined here as an, an assessment of those same variables, uh, maybe the same risk measure uh, that was assessed at the baseline, and then we can compare those two to see how they've changed over time. And so we might get uh, a pattern like this, where we see that at reassessment, risk has decreased. And if change is associated uh, with a change in the likelihood of recidivism, this individual should now be less likely uh, to reoffend at, at the point of reassessment. And, and it's not particularly um, difficult theoretically to, to see why that might be the case. Uh, the current uh, employment status, if we return to that same example, it should be more of a relevant indication of whether someone's going to go on to offend than uh, their employment status from however long ago that the baseline assessment occurred. So it's a, a relatively simple um, concept to get your head around. Um, but what's been particularly interesting in this area is that empirical research ha hasn't uh, or has struggled to find that clear relationship between change and recidivism. And here was a sort of seminal review. There's been a couple others in this area. Um, and, and they memorably described it as searching for the holy grail, you know, this relationship between intra-individual change, so change that an individual make in, in dynamic risk, uh, and, and recidivism. And at this point, and this is now about eight years ago when this review was done or was published, uh, they, they really didn't find that much research, uh, that much evidence to support the, uh, the relationship between change and recidivism. Uh, and one of the things that they noted uh, in that review uh, was some real methodological issues uh, and that people were not controlling for the baseline risk uh, when they were evaluating the relationship between change and recidivism. And just to, to simply illustrate why that's important, so we can see here before where we look at uh, the green man here and, and his change, and we might say at the reassessment, he appears to be now lower uh, likelihood of, of recidivism. But that doesn't mean the same thing as saying that individuals uh, who have lowered their risk are, are more likely, uh, uh, sorry, are, are less likely to, to reoffend than, than others, because we need to take into account that starting point. So we take two examples here, where one started at high risk, has reduced the risk, another started lower risk, but has seen an increase. Uh, but if we look at where they finished up here, uh, the green man is, is still higher risk than, than the red one. And so we would expect his likelihood of recidivism is still higher. So if we were to just look at change by itself, uh, here would actually suggest that those who, who increase their risk are less likely to offend, uh, which obviously is counterintuitive. So what we need to do is really match up those starting points or control for the baseline risk and to see whether for people who start at the same point and make different change, is there a difference in the risk of recidivism? And so we've started to see a lot more of this kind of research, research that's more robust methodologically, uh, looking at this relationship uh, between change and recidivism and, and importantly controlling for that baseline risk. Uh, and so it, it's really started to pile up in, in recent years, the evidence that supports this relationship, um, a lot of it coming through from research institutions, whether that's in prisons or forensic mental health hospitals. Um, and you'll see the name Mark Olvers mentioned in there a lot. A lot of research has come out of uh, him and his colleagues' work uh, with the, the risk measures that they've developed, uh, particularly the violence risk scale and the violence risk scale sexual offending version, uh, which is really well set up to, to look at change over time and then to uh, evaluate whether that change is associated with recidivism. And you can see in there a, a high number of studies that are now finding that relationship. But we're also seeing it uh, within community supervision research. Um, so when scores are being reassessed in the community and seeing uh, whether or not change in, during that time is associated with recidivism. Uh, and I should say it's not all studies that are finding this relationship. We, we still do some, and I know there's been a couple from Australia, one with the VRS that, that didn't find a, a link between change and recidivism. But 
overall looking at the weight of evidence uh, at the moment, uh, there does seem to be now much stronger evidence to support uh, that sort of basic concept of that change in dynamic risk should be associated with recidivism or a change in the likelihood of recidivism. And that's what we seem to find. But there's still improvements that can be made in this area. Uh, and in particular, one that we might want to look at is how can we better look at uh, short-term recidivism? So predicting who's likely to reoffend within a, a relatively short period of time, or looking uh, to get a better understanding of the relationship between dynamic risk and recidivism by looking at assessments done during a time when recidivism can occur. So a community being the, the key one there. Um, and so that requires a certain type of research design, which is, which is much rarer. And we call this a prospective multi-way of design. We can contrast it with the, the approaches that are generally taken. So the classic reassessment or, or uh, research design might be, we have a single assessment in the blue uh, here, and then at a later point, we look at recidivism. So were people who were higher or lower on that first assessment more or less likely to offend? To do any kind of dynamic risk research or to look at the relationship between change, we need at least one other assessment and we can look at change between those two. And this kind of reflects the most common uh, methodology, often with those two assessments being done, say, before and after uh, some sort of rehabilitation program or, or during a prison um, stint. And so uh, that's obviously really important to, to understand that. Um, but to really uh, look at and, and detail the relationship between those factors and how they're changing, particularly in the, in the lead up to any recidivism, we want to change to a, a method more like this, where Following each assessment, we look at whether, assist, whether recidivism occurs uh, shortly after that. And then we can have another assessment uh, and again, check recidivism following that one. And if recidivism doesn't occur, another assessment and another assessment. And so when we've got this kind of data, um, it sets us up really well to do research that's going to give us an understanding of how sort of in real time um, those dynamic risk factors and change in those factors uh, are related to recidivism. And a simple way that we can look at the value of doing that uh, or the value of doing those reassessments is to compare uh, what I've called the reassessment model to, to a baseline model. So where, as we said before, we have an assessment and we look at recidivism following that. Uh, but for the baseline assessment, we just use that very first one or, or some score that's defined as the baseline, and that doesn't change throughout. Whereas in the reassessment model, as we're going through and completing more assessments, those scores can change over time. And we can see how does that relationship recidivism with recidivism change as we can update scores versus when we have to rely on, on one from the beginning where we can't change. So uh, returning to our employment example, where maybe at the start, someone was um, unemployed but a later assessment has since discovered or the system is, is doing well in employment in the area of employment and so that should change uh, the relationship and so we would expect that a reassessment model should be better at predicting recidivism than a baseline model and I've noted a couple of studies down the bottom there that have used this kind of approach, uh, although most of them uh, have only used a few assessments and, and spaced quite far apart. And for, for some variables that we know, or some dynamic risk factors, we know that can change really quickly. Uh, we, we want more frequent reassessment data um, and we want to look at recidivism over that short period to really understand maybe when someone loses a job or a relationship breaks down, how soon or what's that relationship with recidivism really soon after that? And so it was Caleb Lloyd, who had been mentioned before, was my PhD supervisor, uh, who sort of came up with this approach of using a, a multi-wave design um, to look at the value of reassessment. Does doing these reassessments uh, improve the prediction of recidivism? So is there value in, in, in seeing the relationship between change and recidivism? And so he developed uh, a three-step framework. Uh, and the first step was the, the one I've talked you through already, comparing that single most recent one, so the constantly updating score to a single assessment from the start, the baseline score. And then he had second and third steps that involved looking at the average of multiple assessments. And I'll describe those in more detail a bit later. Uh, but for that research, really a large sample of um, individuals on parole here in New Zealand, um, and to summarize the whole thesis in about 10 words, um, 
he found evidence that reassessment did enhance prediction, um, but the effect sizes were, were relatively small. Um, and one of the things he called for was to get some replication of, of that finding. And so uh, that was what we intended to do uh, with our research, the, my PhD research. Uh, the first step was to replicate that, uh, that work by uh, Lloyd and colleagues. The second step was then to uh, extend that framework and to actually examine the unique predictive value of change. And I'm going to explain a bit later what that actually meant, what I mean when I say the unique value. Uh, and then further to explore the unique value um, of other ways of measuring change. Um, so at the moment, I've just mostly talked about change being where you take one score and subtract an earlier score to see what changes occurred. But there's other ways of, of measuring uh, the sort of change that's been occurring. And again, I'll describe that in more, recent, in, in more detail. So I'll try to go through relatively quickly through the first step. As I've kind of mentioned, this is the more straightforward in terms of the conceptual understanding of it. As you update scores, as you incorporate the change that's occurred, you should improve the prediction of recidivism. So that it's more a question of can we empirically show what, what seems to be um, a pretty clear uh, theoretical idea. The second and third steps are a bit more complex uh, theoretically, and so we'll spend a bit more time sort of understanding or going through the underpinnings of those ideas. So how did we do this research? Well, similar to, to the Lloyd research, we had a, sample, a large sample of individuals coming out on parole, or specifically just men uh, on parole here in New Zealand, so about a thousand men. Um, and you can see that characteristics on average about 30 years old, a uh, really high number of um, Māori, um, proportionate to, I guess, the disproportionate rate which we see in, in New Zealand over here. Um, and one of the things that was unique about this study was that we focused solely on people who are high risk. And that's the Rock Roy that I've, I've mentioned there is a static risk measure, um, giving us the, the likelihood 0.65 can be interpreted as a 65% chance of returning, being reconvicted and returning to prison within five years. Um, and so that's roughly the cutoff used for, for high risk over here in New Zealand. So we wanted to use that high risk sample because we, we know, firstly, those are the individuals who are most likely by definition to, to recidivate. Um, and so it gives us a, an opportunity there and a high priority group to understand what's leading to that happening. Uh, and then we also know if uh, the community corrections uh, are following what we know is the best practice, those are also the individuals who are going to be being assessed most frequently. And that's going to give us really good data to look at how change is occurring over time and then look at how those changes are related to recidivism. So on average, these men had been in prison for or sentenced to prison for about three and a half years for violence or property offences. Uh, and we're coming out on parole, so assuming most here today are relatively, relatively familiar with the, the parole system, but they were coming out after serving their prison sentence, uh, either having been granted discretionary release or having come to the full end of the sentence, having never been granted discretionary release, but everyone in New Zealand serves at least six months on parole, whether you are let out early or whether you're let out at the end. Um, so that gave us a six month window where everyone was going to be being supervised by, by correctional, uh, community correctional officers. Uh, and most importantly, being assessed uh, on this measure. So again, I'm assuming Quite a few people will be familiar with this measure. This is the same measure that was used um, in the Caleb Lloyd's research. This is the dynamic risk assessment for offender reentry. Um, it has been uh, used over here in New Zealand for about 10 years now, and it was rolled out in Victoria, I believe, a couple of years ago. Um, it's a 19 item uh, measure broken down into three subscales of stable, acute, and protective factors. Um, so each, each item is scored on a zero, one, two, uh, basically a zero being a no problem and, and two being a serious problem, one being a slight, and, and you can add those up and get uh, subscale total scores. Uh, and the division there is between stable and acute. So these are risk factors, items that are supposed to be associated with a higher likelihood of, of reoffending. Stable ones being variables that are supposed to change slowly um, and acute being variables that are expected to change more quickly. 
protective factors um, are flipped around, it's called the other way around. These are supposed to be variables that are associated with a lower likelihood of, of recidivism. Yeah. And, and there's a whole area of, of research and, and, and conceptual discussion to be had around protective factors, which I'm mostly just parking for today. I'm happy to discuss in, in the questions if anyone has any. But we're going to be focusing mostly on the others and particularly on the acute uh, subscale. Uh, and the reason for that is that in practice, and, and I believe the guidance is similar over there in Victoria, uh, probation officers uh, are told to score the acute subscale on, on every session that they um, meet with someone who's on parole, uh, whereas they're told to sort of keep a watching brief on the other two subscales and, and so that we may not see any change in those uh, on a more regular basis. Uh, maybe in the long term we'd be more likely to see change. So in terms of what the assessments looked like for our sample, uh, we had a baseline assessment, which was for most people just after they'd come out of prison for a few, uh, it was just before uh, they'd come out and a few, it was a bit later. Uh, and then we looked at recidivism and importantly, our def definition of recidivism was that it needed to occur within six weeks of an assessment. So this is where the idea of imminent recidivism comes from. Um, so anything that occurred after that, that person, uh, more than six weeks after the assessment would not fit within that definition. In terms of how frequent our assessments we had, uh, roughly uh, once a week we saw that the assessments were being carried out. So um, we had quite a high frequency of assessments. And so then we had going through and looking at after each assessment, whether recidivism had occurred and in total in our sample we had about 50% of the people who, who were convicted within this six month uh, window. Um, <coughs> so then to look at the value of reassessment uh, within that sample and what did we find? So in the red here we've got the baseline model. So this is the single score that doesn't change over time. How well does that go at predicting that imminent recidivism? Uh, and we can see <laughs> it does, okay, those are dry, all the dry subscales were significantly associated uh, with recidivism. But these effect size measures here, which can be interpreted uh, similar to an R squared and, and the C index similar to an AUC, um, where 0 0.5 would, it would indicate chance. Um, and, and these values are, are small effects. So, so it's better than chance, but, but only just really. Um, and then what we really want to do is compare the red to the blue. So in the reassessment, when we incorporate change, how do we do and does it improve? And so you can see all of these values have increased into the, uh, in the blue compared to the red, um, but particularly for that acute subscale. So we can see that reassessment of the acute subscale uh, had the best impact in terms of improving the prediction of recidivism. And what we can actually do is break that down across the six month, 26 week follow up period and, and see how is it doing, how much better is it doing on a sort of week to week basis in terms of improving prediction. Uh, and you can see here in blue the, the reassessment predictive accuracy versus the baseline predictive accuracy in red. And the blue remains you know, higher in, in predictive accuracy throughout that period. However, if we overlay uh, the 95% confidence intervals to see whether or not these differences are actually significant. We can see that for most of the, the follow-up period, there's a big overlap, uh, except for this one little period uh, of about three or four weeks uh, in the middle of the follow-up. So overall, some evidence here to suggest that reassessing that uh, particularly the acute subscale did improve the prediction of recidivism as we would have expected. Um, but pretty small, uh, pretty small effects on the whole. Um, and so that was kind of the conclusion that we took away from that very first step of our replication. <laughs> and then we move to the next two steps. So the next two steps are to look at averages. And, and the idea behind these two steps uh, is that maybe a, the, that single most up-to-date assessment Although it will improve from a, a single earlier assessment, we know there's, there's unreliability associated with a one-off assessment. Maybe you got that wrong for some reason or, or was entered inaccurately or yeah, there's a bunch of, th of reasons we might think that relying on just that single might, uh, most recent assessment might not be the best approach and maybe we should be actually averaging over time 
um, to sort of get a more reliable estimate of risk. So we, we are taking into account reassessment, uh, but <laughs> um, <coughs> we are going to compare that then uh, to the single most uh, recent score to see if it's actually improved it ahead of that. And so just to quickly show what that might look like in terms of the models that we've been going through. Uh, so we have the proximal score model where we just used a single, and then we can have what we've described as a rolling mean. So we were using all the scores and having an average and comparing that to the single most recent. So we've got three, we average across those three, four, five, and so on. So that's one approach that takes into account all of the assessments and compares those to a single more recent assessment. An alternative is to say, averaging is good because it's going to remove maybe some of that unreliability associated with a single assessment, but maybe we should combine only a few. Maybe some of the older assessments are actually out of date and, and, and are worsening our prediction. And so we should actually, you know, here's an example of just using the two most recent and averaging over those and comparing that to the one most recent. And we can do that for as many uh, as we like, or as many assessments as we have. So that was what we did. Again, replicating that framework um, of Lloyd and colleagues. And here, again, big row of numbers, uh, but looking down from the blue, down through the purple, we're looking to see if there's any change there. And we can see for the stable and for the protect subscales, there's pretty much no change. Those numbers are the same all the way down. However, if we have a look at the acute subscale, we do see some change here. And what we see is that actually averaging appears to worsen prediction uh, compared to just using that single most recent assessment. So although we might have thought averaging uh, would remove that unreliability, here there's evidence to suggest that actually we should just be relying for the acute subscale at least uh, on the single most recent assessment. And so that was the conclusion that we sort of drew from uh, those second and third steps. No evidence that averaging improved prediction compared to the single most recent assessment. So it, it did improve it slightly compared to the, the baseline, but we want to compare it to the best thing we've got, and that appears to be just that most recent assessment. So, so providing some, some good evidence for relying on the most up-to-date piece of information you've got, not averaging it back over time. So those are the results of the, of the first step of our research and, and have been recently published. If you want to have a look at those uh, in, in more detail. But I think uh, where we start to get into the really interesting stuff is to start thinking about how can we extend that framework. And there's some more interesting questions that we can uh, ask and, and hopefully answer. Um, and so if we think about the framework that I've presented, or, or Lloyd's framework, um, what it's really doing is testing whether change is relevant to prediction of, of recidivism. So by updating those assessments, and does that improve prediction? And if it does, that's because taking into account change, it matters and it, it should. You know, again, not theoretically complex. Um, and methodologically, the key thing there is to make sure that we're controlling for the baseline, the starting point, and, and then seeing once we take into account change over top of that, does that, uh, is that associated with recidivism? But we can also extend that and ask whether change is relevant in addition to the proximal risk. So in addition to actually the, fi the finishing point. Uh, and we can do this by looking at the association between change and recidivism after controlling for the most recent. So where before we were controlling for the baseline, the starting point, here we can control for the end point and look at whether change is relevant to prediction on top of that. And so this one starts to get a lot more complex and, and hopefully is helpful to look at an, an example. So here's our example from before. We said it was really important to control for the baseline to account for the relationship between change and recidivism. If you don't do that, then you're going to get a misleading picture of that relationship. And here, actually, what we were saying is that what we need to be looking at is the proximal assessment. And although the green man here has reduced risk and the red has increased risk, the fact that the green remains higher risk than the red at the proximal assessment says that green remains higher risk. So 
really what we're saying here is the proximal assessment is the most important thing. But then what happens if we close these up? And so now it's suddenly not so clear. If you were to compare these two individuals and were to be asked, which of these is most likely uh, to reoffend? Suddenly you've got a question on your hands. Is the answer that they're actually the same risk because proximal assessment is the only thing that matters? So the fact that, let's say for example, they're both currently unemployed uh, is the only thing that matters and, and that means that they're both as likely as each other to go on to commit further offending? Or does it actually matter where they started from? So does it matter that, uh, again to use the employment example, that the green man has maybe lost their job, uh, whereas the red uh, has recently gained some part-time work? Uh, and so they're on different trajectories currently at the same point, let's say actually the green man's currently got part-time work as well. Is there a difference between these two based on where they've come from or is it only relevant where they are right now? And so we can come up with some, uh, some ideas uh, or um, reasons for why it might matter uh, or why change might matter in addition to that proximal risk. And so there was a couple that I sort of went through in my thesis, but I'm just going to focus on one today uh, around the idea that assessments are not proximal enough to, uh, to the outcome. And so what we mean by this is that assessments are not occurring in the immediately preceding um, time before an offence occurs. So even uh, most commonly we'll see, you know, an assessment's done before and after a rehabilitation program in prison. And then we follow that, those individuals up for a year, let's say, and see whether they've reoffended. So obviously that second assessment done in prison is going to be uh, a long time before any event. Let's say they offend after six months. We don't know what's happened during that six months. And then that's what we're talking about here when we say unobserved change. So unobserved um, in the sense that it wasn't measured by some sort of risk assessment measure. Um, and so some sort of change is occurring prior to that recidivism. Um, particularly when we've got that big gap between a final assessment and a recidivism, but it may even, uh, and it certainly will still occur, uh, even if you're doing weekly assessments like we have with our DRAIL data, um, someone might offend the next day after an assessment, um, but there's still something that's presumably happened in between that. So whether someone's got, gone home from a session, they came in to see the probation officer, they've gone home and maybe they've, they've heard some bad news, a family member's ill, that's led to some emotional issues that have followed on to some offending. So some sort of triggers occurred and that change won't have been accounted for uh, in the assessment that was done, even if it was only the day before. So something will have happened in between those two. And it's, not really realistic to ever expect that we'll be able to measure all of that change. Um, but what we can do potentially is to predict that future change. Uh, and I guess the most likely candidate for doing that is to use prior change uh, to assume that people, uh, based on how they've changed previously, we can predict what's going to happen in the future. And so again, to use our example here, we might see our two individuals here clearly have made different change leading up to being at the same point in the proximal assessment. And we might say reassessment of recidivism, we're going to look at at this point after the assessment and what's going to happen after that. Well, again, we might expect that change will continue on in the same. So some sort of continuity of change here where the red will continue to increase in their risk, things will continue to go, go wrong in that man's life. And we see the opposite for the green man who's been making some really good improvements and that continues on. And so actually when we're assessing recidivism, these two individuals will be at different risk. And so change would then be relevant in addition to the proximal risk for prediction. Of course, it may not be that simple. It may actually be the other way around. Uh, so it may be that someone who's come down uh, can easily go back up. And, and someone who's started lower can also return. So uh, you might think of an example of an individual who's been part of a, a gang, have tried to move away from that lifestyle, but they retain some sort of connection to that group. Uh, and, and that has some sort of pull and, and, and they get drawn back into that world. And so that wouldn't be the same for our, our red individual who was lower risk, hasn't had those 
previous sort of connections doesn't have that pull of, of drawing them back into that. So that's just a couple of ideas. What does the research show on this idea? Well, not much really. Uh, we couldn't certainly couldn't find any uh, studies that have intentionally examined this question. Uh, there is some implicit evidence, and I'll, I'll mention in a second what I mean by implicit evidence, but basically studies that didn't set out to directly examine this question, but by either re-analyzing some of the re results that they've presented or going through some of their data, you can draw out some evidence for it. And, and when we do that, we see basically all sorts of different outcomes. So we see some studies that suggest change will continue on. So prior change predicts future change, and therefore change is relevant in addition to the proximal risk. We see some studies that suggest the opposite, that change is actually negative, is negatively associated with recidivism. So that idea that things may turn around or people may revert back to old patterns. And then we see others suggesting that change is unrelated to recidivism. So really the only thing that matters is the current level of risk. And so a really nice indication or example of, of this sort of mixed evidence in this area, a study by Brenda Vos and colleagues, uh, working with the LSIR um, in Iowa. And so got a really colorful graph here, um, but I'll just walk, walk you through it. So along the bottom, we've got a risk level from an initial assessment. So what, what we've been calling a baseline assessment through now. And then the, the colored bars, uh, going along from left to right are indicating the risk level at the reassessment. So if you look in the left hand grouping here, we've got uh, the individuals who were low initially and then in the green who were also low on another assessment uh, when they were reassessed. In blue, the individuals who were low when they were initially assessed and low moderate on their second assessment. In yellow, those who were low and then moderate. And what we see across this graph is a really clear pattern of going up, so step, stepping up based on the risk level that individuals finished up, finished at. So among the individuals who started at low risk, those who finished at low risk were much lower likelihood of recidivism, had a lower recidivism rate than those who finished at moderate, low moderate. Um, and then you see that all the way along, really clear pattern here. And this is an illustration of the basic idea that change is important. Change is relevant to recidivism. People who made change from their baseline assessment, those who increased their risk were more likely to reoffend uh, than those who decreased their risk among those who started at the same point. But what we want to do, and, and, and I sh should be really clear, that's a really important finding and, and that's uh, really key to a lot of what happens in the correctional area. But I guess what we're advocating for in this extended sort of framework and, and looking at what else we can, can pull out of this is to say, well, does it matter where they finished? And if it doesn't matter where they started in addition to where they finished. And so here what we can do is pull together all of those lines. So now along the bottom, we've got the risk level that individuals finished at, so where they were reassessed at. So if change is not relevant in addition to the most proximal, the, the risk whether they finish at, what we should see is a flat line. So it doesn't matter if you started low risk, high risk, whatever, if you finish high risk, then you have the same risk of recidivism. And that's what we see among the medium, high and the high groups. So individuals there, whether they started low, high, medium, if they finished high, they had roughly the same um, recidivism rate. However, then we see some very different patterns among the moderate group. So among the individuals who finished uh, in the moderate risk range, those on the far left are those who started in the low group. So they have increased their risk and you can see they've got a higher recidivism rate. Whereas you compare the, the furthest most, uh, furthest right yellow uh, bar there, those who started high risk and have reduced their risk to moderate at the reassessment have a much lower recidivism. So here we're seeing this idea that those who make positive change are less likely to reoffend. Those who make negative or have seen some sort of deterioration are more likely to offend. This matching with that idea that change sort of continues in the way that it has previously. However, then we see the opposite pattern uh, among these 
two lower groups. So among the low moderate or those who finished low moderate, those who started low and actually increased their risk uh, to low moderate have a lower recidivism rate than those who started high risk and have reduced their risk to low moderate. So these results are more consistent with that pattern of sort of reverting back to a previous level of risk. So, so I guess the main takeaway from this graph is an illustration of how messy this, this is. And, and we're trying to pull out something from, from a study that was not intended to address this question, but does have some relevant data. Uh, but that relevant data seems to suggest there's no clear uh, um, relationship here. So what we wanted to do is actually intentionally look at it and see what we could find. Um, and so just to illustrate what we were doing before, so before what we were doing was essentially the equivalent of this, looking at whether uh, the change from the baseline assessment was adding on top of the baseline assessment, because mathematically it's actually the same whether you use just the single assessment or whether you use the change score and, and look at whether that adds to the baseline assessment. And so we can follow that through uh, and compare those two. But now what we want to do is flip it around and look at whether the change adds anything on top of the most recent assessment. So controlling for that most recent assessment, does change add anything over that? And we can do that in a couple of ways. One is to look at change over the whole follow-up period. So from the single most recent assessment, subtract the initial one. And we can look at whether that adds to the prediction of recidivism, improves the accuracy. The alternative, and this is where we can start to look in more detail at some of the variables or the types of variables that we're working with, some things might be associated um, change over that really short period. So we might only want to look at change over the previous week and see whether that adds anything to the current score. Um, because we might think that among two individuals who are otherwise the same, the, the one who lost their job just last week uh, is higher risk than the one who's been unemployed uh, for a longer period. Uh, and so there we might want to incorporate looking at short-term change and seeing whether that adds anything over top of the current risk level. And so that was what we did. And so when we ran the total change model, so this is take, looking at whether change over the whole follow-up from the most recent back to the baseline adds anything on top of the baseline. And we can see here in the middle column here in the green, no significant improvement. Or the, the, those change scores were not significantly associated with recidivism after taking into account the current risk level and the overall prediction and predictive accuracy of those models. Again, not really any change uh, from just using a single assessment. So long-term change, not really that relevant on top of current risk. However, when we looked at short-term change, and this is just for the acute subscale, the one that we would expect change over or that would be most likely to have a relationship between short-term change and recidivism. We did start to see some relationship um, between short-term change improving the prediction of recidivism. We can particularly see it here, where compared to the scores, those effect sizes in blue, the values in green are, are, are higher and, and indicate an increase in the predictive accuracy when we incorporate change on top of where someone's at currently. So this being consistent with the idea that these changes in acute variables are telling us uh, or giving us relevant information for the prediction of recidivism on top of where someone is at currently. However, it's a really small effect um, that we're seeing. We can see if we chart it over time, these two lines basically on top of each other. <laughs> So I guess the, the conclusion to come out of that line of research was that mostly change scores are not uniquely associated, so that they don't add anything on top of the proximal score. So change is still important. I should keep emphasizing that. Our research continues to find that change is associated with recidivism, but that's because it's telling us where the most recent score is at or what someone's current risk is. Uh, the question of whether change adds on top of that is a separate one, and, and we think of, of some interest, um, but so far not a whole lot of evidence, except uh, with this one exception of the um, acute subscale and, and in the direction of a positive relationship. So individuals who've increased risk 
uh, leading up to that uh, are more likely uh, to recidivate than, than those who haven't, uh, relative to other people with the same current score. <laughs> so, <laughs> weary that we're, we're sort of going uh, a little over time here, but I'll, I'll just quickly just mention the other line of research that was looked at. And this is the idea that change is not necessarily linear. And, and this kind of idea will be familiar. I don't know how many people out there who work in corrections or work with some of the guys that we're not just looking at this, these nice clean trajectories that I've shown so far where things change continues on either an upward or, or downward trajectory. And actually what we might see um, reflected is, is more of this kind of pattern where someone's doing well one week and they're not doing so well the next. And so we see this up and down. Uh, and so what we're interested in is, is, is this kind of pattern uh, associated uh, with recidivism. So not just where, where they started and where they finished, because we might have two individuals like this who start and finish at the same points, um, but in between they've had very different experiences. Um, so it is someone who's kind of got that stability, actually lower risk than, than someone who doesn't, but whose scores, risk assessment scores have been bouncing up and down. And so uh, we've started to look at some of these kind of analyses. And again, starting with that basic premise that the most proximal, the single most proximal assessment is got to be our starting point, the most important thing to look for, and then to see whether or not this kind of variability uh, adds anything over top of that. Um, and in my thesis, we looked at a whole bunch of different ways of measuring that variability, standard deviation, the frequency with which changes occur. Um, and we found some evidence that um, incremental validity, again, only on the, the um, acute subscale, uh, did increase the predictive accuracy. Um, well, sorry, didn't, that it was significantly associated, but overall predictive accuracy didn't really change. Again, not really much of an effect there. So some interesting ideas, I think, here to be explored in, in future research, um, but not a whole lot of evidence to support it just yet. So to conclude then, what have we sort of found? And I think important to come back to the practical implications. And, and um, one of the clear findings that come out uh, is that the DREO continues to provide evidence that it is associated with recidivism, and, and particularly uh, this study and, and the, the study we were replicating, um, both focused on that short-term recidivism. So recidivism um, within six weeks and, and actually mostly within a week or two. Uh, and so uh, some, some good evidence to show that those scores are associated with some pretty imminent recidivism. Um, and, and then Crucially, evidence that reassessment improves prediction. So from a practical standpoint, supporting the practice uh, that I know is um, the policy over there and has been over here for, for a long time now of frequently reassessing, frequently redoing those scores, particularly for that acute subscale um, to get that important information that can guide practice around how should we be working with this individual, what's the appropriate um, intervention. And then, this kind of new area of looking at how important is that change and particularly how important is that change in addition to a, to a current score. So some evidence that they, the acute subscale, you may be wanting to focus not only on where someone's at currently, but how have they changed particularly over some short periods prior to them, this current assessment. Um, but this is a relatively not a new finding and, and we would encourage um, further research before we're sort of making um, broad practical recommendations about how this should be incorporated. But it's certainly something to keep an eye on and fits, again, with sort of our understanding of what we think is going on when, when people go on to, to commit further offending that something's gone wrong, something's changed. And so can we actually measure that? Can we show it empirically? And then... Um, can we use that evidence to, to improve our practice? Um, theoretically, uh, this research is more evidence that these DREA subscales sort of meet the criteria of dynamic predictors. Um, and I've just made a note there that we're talking about the subscales. So uh, we at no point did any analysis just looking at a single item. So even though I've talked all the way through about employment, it's a nice concrete example and to apply these concepts to. Um, 
uh, risk is very rarely, or almost never focused on just a single risk factor. It's always a combination of several ones, and that's why we worked at the subscale level. I think it will be really interesting to look at that and to see uh, whether or what sort of proportion of, of um, recidivism events follow changes in employment status, changes in relationship status. Um, but but those aren't the analyses we've done here. We've, we've looked at the aggregate level. Uh, and then our, our research is, is one of the few studies to, to find support for that distinction between acute and stable, those variables that are expected to change slowly and be associated with recidivism over the long term, and those acute factors that are expected to change quickly and, and be associated with short-term imminent recidivism. Um, but there's still some more that we sort of need to dig in to see whether they're truly signaling imminent recidivism. So how, uh, how reliable is it to say someone's had a big spike in their acute risk scores? Um, can, how certain are we that this person's going to go on to offend because of that? And so our research would say it, it may increase the risk. It may suggest an, an elevation, but it, it's certainly not a 100% foolproof method of saying this person's definitely going to go on to offend. Um, but hopefully we, we've provided a framework uh, for investigating these sort of questions. As I mentioned, most of the evidence in this area is sort of implicit, uh, having to dig into studies, but ho hopefully this provides a more explicit approach for, for other researchers. In terms of uh, next steps in, from this, in this sort of area, um, all of the, the work I've talked about today is focused solely on, on being convicted for any offence, uh, and I know there's a lot of interest in looking at more specific offences, so whether that's violence or sexual offending, or, or in our case, um, a lot of the offences were uh, for violations of parole conditions and you know, breaches. So how, do it, uh, how does reassessment improve the prediction of, of other outcomes that maybe exclude those, those breaches? Um, and so we, and I know um, Caleb and some of the students uh, have been doing some of that work and have some interesting findings coming out in that area. Um, we'd also ideally like to look at some of those items like I talked about before, interactions between the different scales. If someone's got high risk, but also high protective factors, how does that affect the relationship? And then I think a really uh, key area to look at would be to matching that data to practice. In other words, to look at the impact of what's actually happening, how are people responding to those DRAIL scores, um, and how is that affecting our um, our findings here? And, and I guess one of the one of the things that we expect is going on is that people are seeing change occurring. So maybe someone assesses a, an acute subscale and they've increased by three points from the previous week. We assume that most probation officers, community supervision officers, are, are not simply just you know filing that away for next week and, and we'll see you next week and, and are responding in some way and, and likely are responding in some way that actually reduces the likelihood of reoffending, and that may be why we see such uh, or at least one of the reasons why we see such weak relationships between change and recidivism because something's actually stopping it elevating to, to the level of in this case a conviction um, so that would be really good to, to be able to look into that um, and, and tie this sort of heavy data stuff that I've presented today with what's happening in terms of that practice in the field and, and how those two interact. And, and then there's another idea of looking at as frequent assessment as possible. So we had weekly assessment, which is great, um, but the more frequent you can get, the more you can really start to, to dig into the details of this relationship. And that might involve um, sort of getting people to, to uh, complete diaries or self-report studies, which come with their own challenges and limitations, but um, could be an, a, another addition to this area of research and, and help to increase our understanding and, and work towards, um, I guess, methods of practice that can help to, to better reduce reoffending, to help better um, the lives of the people that, that we're working with here. So on that note, just a, a thanks to the, the individuals, the men in the sample that, that we use for this research, and then obviously to my supervisors, Stephen and Caleb, and to the various universities that have hosted me over the last few years and during this research, and, and of the Department of Corrections who uh, provided the data for this research. So I think we'll now throw it over for questions. Okay. Should I? Yep, that's fine. Yep, okay, wonderful. I think everyone can see me now. Uh, I'll just take your spotlight off. Oops. <laughs>
accidentally muted you. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Okay, that was fantastic. Um, thank you very much, uh, Simon. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, first of all, uh, the first question we have here is, during the study, if a risk factor increased, were measures put in place to manage risk? If this is the case, could that account for the low relationship between change and recidivism? Yeah, I mean, that, that was the, the point I guess I was just talking about then. I think it, I, I'm assuming that's going on. I, as I do have some experience working in corrections here, mostly as a psychologist, but I'm working with some probation officers. And, and I know that people are not just <laughs> parking away the, their assessments, um, but in, in terms of quantifying exactly um, what that looks like or, or um, getting a really clear picture of what exactly the response is to an increase of some sort and, and whether we're responding to all increases or only increases among people who are already high risk. Um, we don't really have the, the good research on that. Um, yeah, as I say, there's an assumption there that it's going on and I think it could well be contributing to the low sort of predictive accuracy that we see, um, but it would be nice to be able to quantify that in some further research. Okay, thanks. Next question. How did therapeutic interventions rate in these risk assessment trends? Um, so we didn't look at um, any of the therapeutic interventions. Um, so again, that's the, the major limitation here is to, to not, um, we didn't look at what was driving the change. So there's a whole bunch of reasons that we might be seeing change in, in this, maybe individuals uh, doing it themselves, yeah, it, it may be that intervention from the probation officer, from other correctional professionals, other professionals that they're working with, may be driving improvements. Um, the, the other research, a lot of the research in this area is, as, I, as I've said, drawn from the therapeutic convention, particularly sort of prison rehabilitation programs, and, and they uh, are more willing to make some sort of, uh, I guess, causal attribution in terms of reductions in, in risk being associated with that therapeutic intervention, and then uh, that reduction being associated with lower recidivism. Um, we, we didn't have the information to do that with our community stuff and, and I think it would be great to do that. Um, but yeah, didn't, unfortunately. Okay, great. Can you identify a score increase which leads the corrections officers to become concerned about recidivism? Well, I guess that's the, that's the aim, right? <laughs> Is to, to get to the point of saying, here's an increase, the research, the data really clearly shows that there's a this strength uh, relationship between an increase and the outcome. Um, and I guess what we were trying to do in this research was to look into uh, whether or not it's just that increase that matters or whether it matters on top of where someone's at currently. So um, there might be an assumption that just because we see a, a sudden increase in risk that this is something that needs to be worried about. But I guess if I was to give a takeaway based on our, on our research, it would be that you need to be completely grounded in where someone's at currently in terms of both the, the current dynamic risk and also thinking about static risk. So didn't really talk much about static risk, but that, that's going to be guiding a lot. Um, but obviously it can't change over time. Um, but we start with the static risk, then we look at the current dynamic risk, and then maybe change on top of that leading up to the most recent score may then give us some further impetus or further information to guide some sort of intervention. Wonderful. Okay, um, we have another question. I think you answered this in the presentation, but how was recidivism defined in this in these studies? Yeah, so, so any new conviction. Um, so obviously, hopefully didn't slip too often into saying re-offending. We, we know that most of the offending won't have led to um, uh, an official sanction like a conviction. Um, so uh, it was a, conviction for any offence, right? That's right. Conviction yeah. for any offence, including a, a breach of, of a, um, a parole condition. So yeah, a, a relatively high threshold in terms of moving through the criminal justice system, um, but then also not not really focused on any particular type of offending, which some people would be interested in. I'm sure. Okay. Our next question. Um, to clarify someone's understanding, um, did the research show that stable items didn't really provide much information or practical application at the moment? Um, 
so the, the research shows that the stable factors are certainly associated with recidivism. Uh, they are definitely risk factors associated with it. Um, I, I guess they showed they didn't really improve the prediction of recidivism by reassessing them that much. Um, but there's a major uh, sort of caveat on that is that we were looking at a six month period and I believe the guidance, I'm sure there might be someone on the call who could correct me, but it is to reassess those about once every three months. Um, so it wasn't, we weren't expecting to see a, a whole bunch of change on static and, and the same for the protective items. Um, and so that would explain why we didn't see this great improvement um, in the predictive accuracy by incorporating reassessment. Um, so, so that's probably a product uh, of the short follow-up that we had. Um, we didn't see much change in the scores, and if you don't see change in the scores, then you can't improve prediction through reassessment. Um, but, it, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that it shows that they're not relevant. They certainly are continually, and several studies now show that they're associated with recidivism and should be part of that um, decision-making matrix. But yeah, in terms of the reassessment, we, we may need longer follow-up stuff to, to do anything with them there. Okay, wonderful. Well, I think that um, covers all of our questions. Um, look, thank you very, very much for um, your presentation today, Simon. It was it was really enlightening and extremely interesting. I had my own questions, but we're running out of time. So I suppose I'll catch you another time with a few of my questions. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we can't uh, get an applause. Can't hear anybody, but I'm sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's anyone out there. Everybody, no, no, they're all out there. We've got plenty of attendees all across the world. Um, and um, uh, I'm sure they're really appreciative as well. So um, thanks everybody for attending. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to see you at the next um, seminar that we uh, run. Uh, we haven't yet organized, but um, if you're part of the mailing list, um, you will receive information for it. If you're not on the mailing list, please get in contact with myself or Brett McIvor the Centre for Forensic Behavioural Science and um, we'll uh, endeavour to place you on that list. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. <laughs>